among us. I'm your guide, Derek Hayes. Hello everyone, and thank you for swinging by this evening. And I trust you still have all ten fingers after this week's festivities. Happy Fourth of July to those that celebrate. Now because of the holiday, tonight's episode will be a little bit different to ensure that I too get to down a few beers and chow down a couple of hot dogs this week. I'm going to be taking it easy. And in lieu of a brand new episode, I've instead decided to unlock two extended episodes that normally would only be found on the $5 level of our Patreon campaign. Now the first, the back end of Season 15, Episode 19, and the latter, Season 16, Episode 8, from just last season. Yet another installment of the Sleep Paralysis Files. A limited series I've been slowly unfolding over on the beyond that showcases calls that are most likely sleep paralysis, but still terrifying enough to be taken seriously. In other words, I play, you judge. But also in true Monsters Among Us style, I have a bit of a surprise for you. I have one brand new entry to share at the end of this program. A call that was too on theme not to share this evening, so be sure to stick around for that. Until then, our hotline number is 888-608-NIGHT. Our email is monstersamonguspodcast at gmail.com. And you can find anything you need that's Monsters Among Us related at monstersamonguspodcast.com. Now... On with episode 19 of season 15, already in progress. Good evening, Monster Squad. It is a pleasure to have you aboard with us here this evening, as we cruise past the creepy and float by the unfathomable. I have one hell of a program lined up for you this evening. Only a couple of calls tonight, but high quality calls, no doubt. So let's get started, here with Justin's entry, out of North Carolina. Hi, my name is Justin. I currently live in North Carolina, but during my four years of high school, I lived up in Minnesota with my parents. They had a house in South St. Paul, which is outside St. Paul, Minnesota. A bunch of weird stories about that house. But the weirdest one, well, one of the weirdest ones, there were multiple weird ones. One that comes to mind right away is I had seen what looked like a Native American standing at the top of our stairs. Now, this was back in 2000, maybe 2001. My mom has back issues and she always needed help vacuuming the stairs. I was home that day, so I got fallen told to help her vacuum the stairs. We always started from the top and worked our way down to the main floor. When we were about three-fourths of the way down, something caught my peripheral vision, and I looked up to the top of the stairs real quick, and I thought I saw a Native American. Looked back down, and then it registered what I saw. So I looked back up, and it wasn't there anymore. I got scared. My mom told that I was scared and turned off the vacuum. What's wrong? I said, I saw a goat. She was like, no, 
stop messing around. I'm definitely a kidder, but it definitely wasn't a joke at all. I said, no, seriously. She asked, where? I said, at the top of the stairs. Well, we walked up to the top of the stairs, which was probably 12 steps. When we got up there, there were two feet printed onto the carpet. Now, we had just vacuumed that floor, so every other step was that streak you get when you vacuum. I looked at the feet, and I said, those are bigger than my feet. My feet were the biggest in the house. Mom said, well, maybe my best friend Dan, maybe his feet were left here. I said, Mom, Dan hasn't been here in a week. And I put my foot in it, and it couldn't have been my buddy Dan's feet either, because it was about twice the size of my foot, and Dan's was just slightly bigger than my foot, and it just creeped me out. There are many, many other stories that I definitely could share. I don't want to take up all your guys' time, but maybe share down the road. I just started listening to your podcast this past week, and I have dove in. I'm already into the second season, about to go into the third. Just love what you guys are doing. Keep it up. Thank you. Have a great night. Thank you, Justin. I've been there, buddy, as I talked about on last week's episode. I have several calls like this, folks seeing a native spirit of one sort or another, which really helps sell the concept of ghosts or hauntings, in my opinion. Because if you can believe that ghosts of pilgrims, colonialists, Civil War soldiers, etc. can exist or floating around our ether. Then you better assume the same for First Nations people as well. After all, their culture had been here for thousands of years before Europeans ever set foot here. So surely there is some remainder there as well. And you know, according to Justin's entry, there certainly is. Great call, Justin. Thank you for taking the time to share it. I love to cook, but sometimes I get busy and it's hard for me to get to the store and plan out meals for the week. And lately I've been trying Green Chef and really been enjoying it. It's convenient and it keeps me from getting bored with repeat meals. Plus I get to enjoy the fun part of cooking. Now Green Chef has over 80 weekly menu options to satisfy every taste bud and suit every diet, including keto, plant-based, gluten-free, and more. Green Chef makes it easier for me to eat healthy because the recipes feature farm fresh, clean seasonal ingredients like artichokes, dates, and sustainably sourced seafood. And it all tastes amazing. I love the convenience of having everything delivered straight to my door. And all of the ingredients are pre-measured, making cooking so much easier. There's no prep, and most importantly, no food goes to waste. And here's an awesome added bonus. Every Green Chef customer gets a free session with a registered dietitian to support your clean eating lifestyle with nutritional advice. Green Chef is offering MAU listeners a great deal right now. So go to greenchef.com forward slash monsters50 and use code monsters50 to get 50% off plus 20% off your next two months. That's greenchef.com forward slash monsters50 and use code monsters50 for 50% off plus 20% off your next two months. Green Chef is the number one meal kit for eating well. No big thanks again to everyone for joining us here this evening. Your support means the world to us. Things have been a bit hectic lately. The season is finally winding down, though, and the premiere is only a week away, so I see the light at the end of the tunnel. And I certainly hope I see many of you there at the premiere. Times are certainly busy, as they say. But I'm not going to let that stop us from pumping out the additional content. And this next one is a shiver inducer out of the state of South Carolina. Hey, Derek. This is Dave from Goose Creek, South Carolina. These stories take place in the late 1970s, early 80s. And for me and my sister, that was quite some time ago. 
Now, we grew up on 20 acres of land in Fairfield County, South Carolina. Our nearest neighbor was approximately a mile, mile and a half away. And it was generally a nice area. I'm going to start off with my little sister's story. Now, we lived on 20 acres of land with about an acre to two acres that were cleared. The rest were wood. Places that we didn't think twice about tromping around on in summer, winter, whatever. No concerns about getting snake bit or anything else like that, or even seeing stuff weird. We did have two street lights on the property where our trailer, where we grew up, grew up in a single wide trailer, was situated. There were trees and some outbuildings between it and that, so there was some light, but not much. And usually when we got up in the middle of the night, the only thing turned on bathroom light. So one night, my sister gets up, she decides to go get something to drink, and she's walking down the hallway, past my bedroom, then through the living room, and into the kitchen. She goes into the kitchen, she turns to look out the windows there in the kitchen next to the back door of the trailer. And lo and behold, in the window, she sees two red eyes. Now, she has no idea what this is, but at that point in time, she decides to herself, nope, I'm not all that thirsty. So she turns right around and books it right back to bed. Go ahead and fast forward a, a year or two, and I guess by this time I'm 10 or 11. It's a Saturday night, and I wake up in the middle of the night, and I happen to look up, and again, no lights or anything like that in the room, and I see this face. And the only way I can describe the face is frightening tell it was a face of course this is 40 years ago now and having trouble really describing it but it was evil looking you know it gave you that feeling of evil if i think back on it now and trying just to describe it the best way i can describe it i didn't see a body that it was attached to mind and for some reason i went right back to sleep and I woke up again later on and screamed bloody murder. My mom and dad came in. I think I even woke up my little sister. And uh, they comforted me. And I finally drifted off back to sleep. Of course, I told this to my Sunday school teacher. And she said that it was Satan. One other little interesting fact about our property is you could walk through the woods and you would see, I guess it was about a half a mile, three quarters of a mile from my trailer. There was an old dilapidated church. And if I remember correctly, it did have a graveyard. That church is almost gone. It's still near the property today. Last time I was there, a year ago. And if you trace through the woods, if you followed these creeks from our property, you know, onto the, the neighboring property, I have no idea who owned it. It was all woods anyway. And that was behind this old beat up church, which is old, old timber. You would actually come across the baptismal pool there in the woods that was surrounded by two by fours. It was, I don't know, two, maybe three feet deep, a little bit bigger than your standard bathtub. Now, my sister and I always joked that maybe it was an old possible black church, slave church from back in the day. And somewhere on our property, I don't know where it was, my grandmother would take us out there. And there was an old cabin at one point. There was an old rock chimney. That was all that was left. Now, this property's been sold for almost 20 years. So my sister and I are going to try to go up there this summer, later this summer, and talk to the new owners who we know who sold it. We'd like to go up and see what property like now, take photographs of it. But that's my little story. I want to say that I love your podcast. I'm pretty much caught up. Thanks, Derek. Have a great day. Thanks, Dave. You know, these sort of sound like Bigfoot experiences to me. And experiences like these with the big guy really did seem popular in the 70s and early 80s. And I have two guesses as to why that might be. First, that's when the films Legend of Boggy Creek and Creature of Black Lake were released, so people had monsters out the window on their mind. But, in 
Remember what we established earlier about big old butts? But the 70s and 80s were a different time. There were bigger swaths of land that sat vacant. Houses weren't right up next to one another like they are today. There weren't nearly as many cars on the road. And there just weren't so many people around back then. So I suppose it's entirely possible that out-of-the-way places like South Carolina, at least out-of-the-way in terms of Bigfoot, see a wandering Sasquatch from time to time, where I would at least admit that that scenario would be a whole lot more likely back then than it would today. So per usual, I throw my hands in the air. Whatever it was, Dave, we do thank you for making the phone call. Jess from Pennsylvania. Welcome to the program. Now, quick warning there are a few details pertaining to suicide in the following call. Hello, my name is Jess. I am from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Big fan of your podcast. My story is actually from about 15 years ago when I was around eight or nine years old. I went back and forth between my mom and my dad and my stepmom. My mom lived in Pittsburgh. My father lived in Minnesota. I would go down to his house on holidays and summers. And at this particular time, he had bought a farmhouse. Very cheap. No one had lived in it for quite a while had all of the buildings and equipment reminiscent of being a farm home. It had the silos and the barns and an old tractor, all of this old equipment. But we just used the farm home. My dad was a truck driver. He wasn't there a lot of the time as well. And one thing about this farmhouse particularly is that it was just weird. You didn't feel comfortable there and a lot of weird things would happen. Things would go missing and be gone for days and then all of a sudden you'd find them in another room just sitting on top of the table in plain sight so you know you would have seen if you would walk past it we would leave the house all the windows and doors would be locked we would come home and every single light in the house would be turned on and the first couple of times my dad thought it was maybe someone messing with us or a burglar but after it continued happening over and over You would go in the house, every single door and window would be locked. Our German Shepherd Keisha would be laying down peacefully. Nothing was bothered, nothing was disturbed, but every single light in the house would be on. My dad and my stepmom were pretty aware of spirit in spiritual realm. They had things happen to them in their childhood that had made them more open to that experience and that side. So they knew that it was probably haunted but their opinion of it was you know it's just the ghost being mischievous nothing's being harmful nothing is malevolent nothing to worry about so we would just ignore it the one thing about this farm home in particular is that my room would be upstairs and then another bedroom that we used for storage in the bathroom and my parents room the living room dining room and kitchen was all on the main floor of the home and No one liked going upstairs, me in particular. I hated sleeping in my room. You walked up there and every single hair on the back of your neck would stand up. The air felt thick and heavy. And even though all the lights would be on, it was so dark. You just felt not welcome. And I was actually so scared of going up there that my parents wouldn't make me sleep upstairs. They let me sleep in their room on the floor. They would put a bunch of blankets and pillows on the floor and just let me sleep on the floor next to their bed because I was so scared to go upstairs by myself. And I remember this one particular day, my dad had been working outside, pulling weeds, you know, cutting grass, doing landscaping around the house. My stepmom was inside cleaning and I wanted to be outside keeping my dad company. And I remember sitting in front of the garage. The garage door was up. I was sitting cross-legged like a pretzel in the middle of the garage doorway, staring in the garage, and I was talking to someone. 
And my dad, who was behind the garage at the time, said that he heard me and he first talked it up to me having an imaginary friend or pretending and just doing what kids do. Well, he said he noticed that the conversation was more intelligent than a couple of kids. It sounded like someone was asking me questions that I was answering. He came around the side of the garage and he continued listening. And I was just having a conversation with this thing. It was asking me who we were, where we were from, why we were here. My dad had come around the corner of the garage and asked me who I was talking to. I looked at him, I said, I'm talking to the blue man. And I pointed my finger in front of me and I turned my head back and there was no one there. And I was very confused because I remember talking to someone and looking at someone and my dad asked me who I was talking to. And I said, well, there was a blue man. He was standing right there. He was asking me who we were, why we were here, where we were from, and we were just talking. And my dad got really freaked out and decided that was enough outside time for that day. He put everything back in the garage, took me inside, and called it a night. A couple days later, I had gotten in trouble. I think I had drawn on the wall or put stickers on the wall or, or something bad. And I deserved a punishment. So my dad, he never hit me. He never spanked me, anything like that. So my punishment was I had to sleep upstairs in my room for that night. And I was so scared. I just started crying. I was crying for hours. I was so petrified. I did not want to go upstairs and sleep by myself. But my dad said, you know, you did something bad. This is your punishment. I had to go upstairs, and I just remember laying in bed, feeling so scared and having a blanket over my head, just feeling something in the room with me. It felt like I was being watched. I couldn't see anything. It was pitch black, but it just felt like someone was staring in the back of my head. At this point, I don't remember much after me laying in bed until... After a certain point, I had asked my dad and my stepmom, who had filled the blanks in for me a couple years later, who were unfortunately passed now, but they did help me understand and fill in the blanks that I couldn't remember from being a child. And they said that they were in their room watching a movie, and all of a sudden they could hear me talking. And they could hear me through the vents because it was an old farmhouse. You could very easily hear people talking. My room was actually directly above where their room would have been, downstairs. So they muted the TV and they said they were trying to listen. My stepmom went up to the vent and pushed her ear against it to try to hear what I was saying. She said a lot of it was mumbled. She couldn't particularly hear what I was saying. But at the end, she heard me say, Wait, why? Please don't hurt me. And she ran up those stairs like lightning and busted through my room. I remember almost being broken out of a trance. I remember her opening the door and the light coming in through the hallway. And I was sitting in front of my closet. My closet had a sliding door that you would move over and it was slid open about six inches. And I was sit cross-legged like a pretzel directly in front of it. And my stepmom asked me, who are you talking to? I said, I was talking to you. You were in a blue dress. You were in the closet. But no, I wasn't. Jessica, who were you talking to? And I was so confused because I remember thinking that it was my stepmom at the time, but it was a thin white woman, and I don't know how I could see her. It was pitch dark, but I could see her in the closet. The thin white woman with black hair, and she was wearing a blue strapless sequin cocktail dress and she was asking me questions in the closet and I don't remember what she was asking me I just remember feeling scared and wondering why my stepmom wanted to hurt me my mom scooped me up drug me downstairs and I actually slept in their bed in between them that night at this point summer was almost over so I I was going to go back to my mom's house soon in Pittsburgh. My dad just let me sleep on the floor next to them. For the last two weeks, I was there, and it was time for me to go home. 
He explained to me a couple years down the road when I was asking him about this. At the time, he didn't understand what to do because we weren't religious. He believed in a higher being, but we didn't have any particular religion that we followed that we could turn to. So my dad thought the best thing to do would be to research and figure out what these spirits were or if they were spirits or if it was some malevolent thing taking on the body of something. He didn't know. He wanted to figure it out. He didn't want to be left completely powerless. So after I had went home, he had called the realtor who had sold him the home. And he told him, like, look, my daughter's seen things. She's seen people. Now they're telling her that they're going to hurt her. And I do not feel safe. I need to know what happened here. I need to know who lives here. And he said the realtor seemed kind of freaked out when he told him what I had seen. But he had explained that the most recent owner of the home was a father and a son. His father was very sick. He had actually died in the house. And his son, who was trying to maintain the farm by himself, wasn't able to do it. I'm not sure if he fell into a depression, but he had committed suicide by hanging himself in our garage. I found out that it had been a few days until anyone had found him. And by the time the cops and everyone had showed up, he was blue and cold. And that was the blue man that I was talking to in the garage. And the woman in the blue dress really scared the realtor because he had seen her too. And at first he chalked it up to just his imagination and he didn't really think much of it again until my dad brought it up. But whenever he was showing another couple the farmhouse before my dad, said he had come out to give them some privacy to look around the home themselves. He came outside and he looked in his truck and there was a woman sitting in the passenger seat of his truck. He said it was a thin white woman with black hair and she was wearing a blue strapless sequin cocktail dress. And he said he felt his heart drop to his stomach because it just didn't feel right. And he said, who are you? Why are you in my truck? When the couple came out behind him, he looked behind him, he looked back, and she was gone. So that really freaked him out. But whenever they had finally sold the home to my dad, there was a bunch of old stuff in the attic that had to be removed that the realtor had agreed with, I think it was a bank or someone, that had to be removed before my dad could bring all the stuff in. Because, like, it was from floor to ceiling full. And the realtor said when they were carrying out all of this stuff, there were certain things that they had set aside that they weren't sure if they should throw away, and they were all in this particular box. And he was looking through them, and it was like jewelry, things of value, things you would either want to donate or not throw away. And he said one thing was a beautiful picture frame that he had picked up, and it was a woman, thin white woman with black hair in a blue sequin strapless cocktail dress, standing. And he said that he instantly felt sick because that was the woman that he saw in his truck. He said he threw the picture frame away. He wanted it out of his sight. He never wanted to see it again. He wanted to pretend that that had never happened because he was a skeptic. He didn't believe in stuff like that. And he had successfully done that until my dad had called him and it just reinforced everything when he said that I saw a white woman with black hair and a blue sequin strapless cocktail dress. After that, my dad sold the farmhouse We moved in another house in Minnesota that we lived in for quite a while until it burned down. But that was my really uncomfortable and scary experience in a farmhouse that I will carry with me forever that still haunts me to this day. I hope that everyone enjoyed it. And thank you so much for making your podcast. I really do love listening to it. Have a great day. Thanks, Jess. So much activity. And that woman in the cocktail dress. She's something out of a Stephen King novel for sure. Well, thank you for sharing those experiences with us, Jess. It sounds like quite the paranormal adventure. 
having grown up there. The greatest lines from Long Beach. He was taken to the hospital where he died. Then taken off duty and on and on as far as. Ooh, that was a good episode. If you like what you hear, don't forget that you can access a lot more content just like it by joining us on Patreon. Five bucks a month gets you all the goodness, and one buck a month gets you all the main goodness ad-free. And peruse it all at no cost for seven full days using our free trial. Oh, and I just checked the numbers, and a huge percentage of you free trial folk are sticking around, and for that I am eternally grateful. So check it out if you haven't, and see what's keeping all these folks engaged. Now, for something a little bit different. Season 16, Episode 8's Beyond Portion, the newest installment of The Sleep Paralysis Files. Now this week on The Beyond, we're going to do something a little different. We're bringing back a segment I like to call the sleep paralysis files. Now essentially it goes like this. There's a few subjects on the show I try to stay away from. And sleep paralysis is one of them. Because despite how creepy they are, we do know the origin of the activity. But like I said, they certainly are creepy. And it'd be a shame not to share some of these terrifying experiences. And the calls will come uninterrupted. So please enjoy the second installment of The Sleep Paralysis Files. And I'll catch you all back here next week for a brand new episode. Hey everyone, this is Patty from Toledo. And this time I'm calling with, I guess it's an experience of sleep paralysis. I've been experiencing this for as long as I can remember. The weird thing is though, is that I haven't had any of these experiences since I had my son two years ago. And unfortunately, I think I may have passed them on to him. But anyways, ever since I was a little kid, I would have, I guess, really bad dreams, night terrors, to the point to where I would become aware in the dream that I was in a dream and that I needed to wake up. And typically... I would wake up by crying and calling for my dad. And initially, the way it always goes is I am, like, in this dream, and I'm crying, and I'm calling for my dad, but I can't physically, I can feel that I can't physically get myself to actually say, stop, or actually cry. The buildup comes up, like, I, I get enough energy or something to make myself start speaking out loud and I'm still crying fully asleep eyes closed I'm still in this like dream state and I don't know for what reason but it's always been my dad that I call and I don't know maybe he's just a light sleeper but ever since I was a little kid he would hear me and he would come and he would slowly wake me up it was never like shaking me awake or anything it was real gentle you know he'd start calling my name He'd tell me that he was there, that everything was fine, and that I was safe. And slowly but surely, I would come out of it still crying, you know. And sometimes it would be, you know, like the hyperventilating crying that you do as a little kid. I think most of us know it. You can't even catch your breath. And whatever I was dreaming or seeing is instantly gone. All I'm left with is, like, the essence of it. Like, I can feel it. I can almost picture it like something that's on the tip of my tongue, but I can't bring it back anymore. And like I said, this has happened all my life. I'm 37 now, and it's only been the last couple years that it hasn't happened anymore. And there have been a few times where my son will be napping with me in bed, and he'll start whimpering, and I can see the tears starting to form in, like, the corners of his eyes. So I do the same thing that my dad did to me and I, you know, caress him and I tell him that I'm, I'm right here and that everything's okay and that he's safe and he slowly starts to wake up. So yeah, it's really weird and I'm actually pretty pissed that I think I might have passed this on to him because 
It's horrible, 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 horrible. I wish I could tell you what I've seen, but I don't remember. But I know that what I've seen is traumatizing. I don't know how else to put it other than like, I don't know, maybe stuff you see in hell, stuff from the devil, evil. It's always been there and it's always been very traumatic. I think the hardest thing for me is the fact that I have become aware that I'm not awake. It's a complete dream state. Maybe I'm somewhere else. I don't know if it's an out-of-body experience or what. I'm not sure if it's even sleep paralysis if it falls under that category. Since when I wake up, whatever I was seeing in my dreams is not there anymore. I'm back in like the now, in the present. That is my experience. Thanks. Hi, Derek. I'm calling to report something. I guess I'm a long-time listener, first-time caller, and heard all these stories about, you know, sleep paralysis and all these different things, but I've never had an answer for this one, so here I go. This is in Louisiana and Texas between 2004 until now. And I had sleep paralysis for, I'll say, a year straight. And I'm not going to get into that today, but what I'm going to get into are two that I've never explained. So I have to give you a little context. The first thing was I was with my father. We were in the hospitals and we were walking in the surgeon's quarters. I look at this man prepping for surgery. I would have never remembered. But then when I'm in bed that night sleeping, I wake up in sleep paralysis and I look and there's the man. He is the surgeon from earlier, but he's covered in blood. Not only is he in my room, There's also a table with all the surgical instruments that I could feel this heaviness that I can't even explain. It was terrifying. I mean, it was so real. I was afraid to sleep for a long time because of these experiences. Okay, so that's the first one I couldn't explain because this man, this man was alive. I've had experiences where I saw things that were definitely not, but this was somebody that I knew wasn't dead or spirit or anything like that. Okay, and then another one, within the next year this happened, I was in the St. Vincent Mall in Freeport. I was in a hair salon, and this woman came in, and she was speaking Spanish, trying to get this woman to understand that she needed her hair changed, and so I translated for her. I would have never remembered this either. I would have just slept, but, you know, and not remembered that part of my day, but I was just shocked, and I felt something grab my hand in my sleep. I wake up, and I look, and there is a woman on the ground and it's the same woman from earlier that I translated for. Let me say earlier that day, I could tell there was something wrong with this woman, but like she was afraid. There was somebody that was scaring her and she didn't even have time to get her hair cut that day. After I translated everything she needed, she just ran out. Well, in the dream, I see her on the ground and she's speaking in Spanish, but you know how you understand everything in your dream. And she's talking really fast, but she's saying that she's afraid of Carlos and that he's coming. And then I feel this darkness and I see this blackness in my doorway. And that's all I remember. I just wake up from my bed. But I know that woman wasn't dead. I mean, at least earlier that day, she wasn't. So I've heard lots of different explanations. People have told me that it was a psychic attack. And I wasn't okay with that because I'm just, I don't like to say Christian because of how loosely people use that. But I mean, I'm a Bible believer strictly and... And I just wasn't okay with the idea that it was something psychic, not of God and of Christ. And I've come to really understand some of these things now. And I think the Lord uses the Holy Spirit. And I I don't mean to offend anybody, but I really believe now that the reason that He showed me those terrifying experiences is that the Holy Spirit could use me to help these people and reach out. I know this sounds crazy, but I really got a strong inclination when I saw the surgeon and he had blood all over him and just the weight of all these lives on his shoulders. I got a sense that maybe he was using drugs and I think maybe the Lord puts things like that in our dreams and stuff so that we can help, so that we can witness because these people were alive and they were needing help. Maybe their spirits reached out to me because they knew that I would pray for them. I'm not real sure, but if anybody has any insights, I'd love to hear. And I really hope that this makes it. Thanks a lot. Hi, this is Joe. I'm in Southern California. This happened when I was about 19 years old, so around 2000, I think, 2001 maybe. So I was, I've always been into UFOs and aliens and things like that. So you might be thinking that I just had an imaginative mind and, you know, imagine this and it was just sleep paralysis. But no, this, this was an abduction, I'd like to say. 
And I don't want to say alien abduction because I didn't see an alien. My eyes were closed for about like a minute. The weird thing about all this, though, that I wanted to tell you about is that it was like the most frightening thing ever. can't even explain how scary it was. It was like I was a guinea pig. It was like experiencing ego death, if that's possible, or something. Just this primeval terror. You know, it was just startling and couldn't get out of it. Um, you know, I'm a 6'4 guy. Back then I was weightlifting and nothing scared me. And that was the most terrifying thing of my whole life in one minute. I remember seeing a flash of light outside my window prior. Just like right when I realized I was being paralyzed, I remember two things. It was the light. I just remember a flash of light. And then also that it was happening again. Or they're here again or something like that. I remember just having this familiarity uh, with the whole thing, but at the same time, it's the most scariest thing. So I just wanted to throw that out there if anyone else can relate. I had some other weird things that I thought were more dreamlike. This one was real. I'll try to call about those later. Thank you. Hello, my name is James from California, and I am just have a bit of a story that's been ongoing for a long time. When I was in college, I remember waking up in the middle of the night and not being able to move at all. It wasn't like sleep paralysis. I've had that before. And in that one, I was able to actually move around, kind of shake back and forth. I could actually hear myself rapidly breathing while going through that. And then when I woke up, everything was you know, back to normal and everything was gone. But with this one, this, was, this instance was very different. It was extremely scary, on a whole nother level. And the environment, that my bedroom was actually completely lit up. It was very bright, and I could actually see the creatures standing in front of me. My bed was completely on the ground. I was laying on my side, and I just snapped awake instantly, find myself completely frozen from head to toe. I was not able to breathe, really. I could not move anything at all in my body. And there are three creatures in front of me. Two of them were standing so I could see their feet. And another one had gotten down onto its hands and knees because, as I said, my bed was completely on the floor. So it got down on its hands and knees. And then it proceeded to basically turn its head to the side so that our heads were basically matching with each other. They were parallel to each other. This lasted for about two or three seconds. where It was looking me straight in the face, probably about, I'd say, about a foot away about a foot away from my face. And then after that, the entire image went completely black. There was nothing beyond that. I didn't wake up from it. And I don't recall having any dreams the rest of the night. I just remember waking up the next day and thinking to myself, this was just something completely different and wondering why the heck didn't I wake up from that? It was very frightening to go through that. The creatures that I actually did see they were gray in the face. They had uh, very large eyes. They're the typical gray aliens that people have described. And the three of them, were they were identical to what the people have been describing that I saw in front of me. They didn't say anything to me. I didn't hear any voices in my head, which is what something people also say. It just kind of looked at me blankly, just a blank face, very emotionless. And then the image just went black. Just as soon as it started up, I saw them for about five seconds total, and the image just went black. And I don't remember anything beyond that for the rest of the night. I can't think of anything else. Oh, I was hearing a humming sound. It was a very low humming sound during this brief five seconds while going through it. I have no idea what it was from. Maybe it sounded like it was some sort of engine or craft, maybe. I don't know where it came from because the house that we live in is out in the woods. It's by itself. You can't really hear cars from my bedroom, especially in the middle of the night. It was like a, definitely a very low humming sound. It wasn't the sound of like a car engine because you can hear the engine and the pistons going. You can hear that quite uh, distinctly. But this was like just a very smooth, low hum that I was hearing during the, the few seconds that I saw this. And yeah, that's basically it for that experience. Hope this helps you out. Bye. Hey, Derek. This is Chris from Atlanta. 
and I'm calling to tell you about a shadow person or shadow figure story. It's actually my husband. He told it to me. So this happened a few weeks ago, or actually a few months ago. I think it was in January or February. We had all been sick, and he was the last one to get it, and just a bad cold. And so we were sleeping, and I had noticed that he had gotten up like around maybe one or two in the morning. And so next thing I know, he's coming back in the room and he's telling me, I think I'm going to sleep in here because I was sleeping on the couch, but I just, I want to sleep in here now because he was coughing and everything. And I said, yeah, that's fine. You know, wherever you want to sleep. But in the morning when we got up, he told me that the reason he had come back in to sleep in the bed was because he had had an experience on the couch. And I said, well, what are you talking about? So he said, well, I was asleep. I had finally gone to sleep after coughing. And on the couch, you know, we had the recliner up and everything laid back. And he said something woke him up. He didn't know if it was like a noise or a feeling. He woke up and he went to move to, you know, just to move. Like when you wake up, you move. And he said he couldn't move. All he could move was his eyes. So he was paralyzed. He said he could move his eyes and he heard someone walking around him. And he had thought someone had broken in maybe and that for some reason they had given him something because he couldn't move but he was sitting there and he heard something behind him walking and this house is super creaky everywhere you walk on the floorboards like they creak so he said that he heard them directly walking behind the couch and down to the hallway and he said it scared him really bad my husband does not scare easy he's a guy's guy he's a car guy he grew up in a rough part of Atlanta so it's not a lot to scare them. So it scared me when it said it scared him. <laughs> yeah, he said he was paralyzed, could only move his eyes. And that after, he said probably 30 seconds, he said it seemed like forever, he could move. And as soon as he said he could move, he got up, he got his gun, and he searched around the house to make sure. Well, first he said he went to check on me and my daughter to see if we were still asleep. And see, we were, he said we were dead asleep. But anyway, and he's also had another experience when he lived in Gainesville, Georgia, and he was on his stomach in bed, and he heard somebody creak at the floorboards, like he said, right at the threshold of the doorway, the floorboards would creak, and something creaked. And then before he could even, like, get up to look up, it was sitting on him. He, felt, he said he felt this great pressure on him, and he felt it breathing on his neck. And that was the only other instance besides this one that he's experienced a shadow figure, what he thinks is a shadow figure, because he's, he's experienced this before. He's never actually seen him, but he just, they paralyze him and he can't move, you know? So I haven't seen it. My mother-in-law said she thinks she's seen it. And, you know, we were just saying, and the people in the house believe in Jesus. Jesus Christ lives in this house. He lives in us. You're not welcome here. You need to leave. And I haven't seen him, knock on wood. My husband hasn't experienced anything either, but he's gotten sick before after that. And I asked him if he wanted to go to the couch and he said, nope. And I said, I don't blame you. Anyway, that's my shadow figure story. Thanks a lot. Bye. These skill sets don't exactly complement each other. When he's being father told me I think I know there is no Hi, my name is Michelle. I'm calling because I met Sarah and I have a story for you, so I'm gonna tell you. Back in 2006, I was trying to sleep in my bedroom with my husband at the time, and he was a very heavy snorer and I couldn't fall asleep. So I left the bedroom and I went into our living room and laid down on the couch on my back. And it was like a love seat, a two-seater couch. So it was kind of, you know, my legs were hanging off one side and my head was on the armrest of the other side. And I fell asleep and I got woken up by something pulling my hair, like pulling my ponytail. And it woke me up out of my sleep. And then I felt this crushing sensation on my chest, like something was on top of me, pushing me into the couch to the point of like, I almost felt like I was going to fall through the couch. There was so much pressure put on me. And I tried to scream. And no matter how loud I screamed, no sound would come out of my voice. It was just silent, even though I was screaming. And I was screaming for my husband and I was screaming for my oldest son. And I was just screaming their names. And it was almost like the pressure went away from my chest and I was paralyzed with fear, just completely paralyzed. I couldn't get up off the couch to go for help or anything. Again, this was about in 2006 at night. 
It's the only time that ever has happened to me. Ever since then, I've never slept on my back out of fear that it happened again. But something definitely pulled my ponytail and was pushing me into the couch. And I was wide awake. I was not sleeping at this point because I couldn't go back to bed. Anyway, that's my story. Thanks. Bye. Hey there, Derek. This is Jay from California. I called in before, but I just got my memory jogged recently. I listened to an episode of Glory Photos. This story takes place in Northern California, the house that I was raised in. And this happened probably about 16 years ago or so, so I would have been about six at the time, pretty young. And this house that I grew up in was an old farmhouse that, at the time that I was living in it, was about 102 years old. Not that that is super important to the story necessarily, but potentially. So I was sleeping in my bed, and it was sort of later at night, you know, maybe 10:30, 11, somewhere in that range. So it was late for me, and I remember, you know, tossing and turning, trying to fall asleep, and all of a sudden I remember this sort of feeling of something being in the room with me, and something being at the foot of my bed and I sort of peek out from the covers and I don't see anything. All of a sudden I feel this pressure on my chest and it felt like something was sitting on top of me, but it didn't feel like someone was holding me down. It felt more like some sort of animal, like a large dog was sitting on top of my chest. And in fact, when I opened my eyes, I could see the shadowy figure of a dog that didn't have any distinct features. It almost reminded me of the shadow people stories that I've heard on your show, but like a shadow canine. It was a really strange occurrence, and it could have been chalked up to some sort of night terror or a sleep paralysis type deal, but it really shook me up. And in the following years, embarrassingly, I developed a uh, bedwetting problem. So that's my story, and I hope you have a good one. Hi, Derek. I just found your podcast and have been enjoying binge listening on the Facebook page. This short yet frightening experience happened in my sleep. I would normally write this off as just a bad nightmare, but since it has a two-part tandem experience, I thought I would share it. I will preface this with that I have experienced sleep paralysis in my lifetime, 58 years, but not with any pattern or consistency. This happened about a month and a half ago. I was asleep and this very dark shadow loomed above my head. There was a vague human shape, but no real detail other than a very dark shadow. And, for lack of a better term, its hands wrapped around my neck and started choking me. It was a tight choke and I could feel the pressure on my neck. I couldn't breathe. I literally couldn't breathe. I panicked and I was terrified. I couldn't move. So with my mind, I screamed at it. In the name of Jesus Christ, I demand that you let go. In the name of Jesus, get away from me. I repeated at least once more. And poof. Shadow disappeared. And I woke up. My husband lay beside me fast asleep and it took me about ten minutes to calm down. I was afraid to go back to sleep, and I didn't think I would be able to, but I eventually drifted back. The shadow loomed over my head again, except this time it wasn't as dark. Just as it reached out to me, I screamed at it with my mind, Get away from me. You do not have permission to touch me. Get away from me. And the shadow dissolved. Apparently, I was screaming out loud this time as my husband was now trying to wake me to console me. The experience was so disturbing, I didn't tell them the details. We just went back to sleep. Maybe they were just two incredibly intense back-to-back nightmares, but damn boom, it was terrifying. Don't know if this is interesting enough for the podcast, but it feels good to share it. Keep up the good work. Hey, Derek. My name is Tori, and I'm from Colorado. Wanted to tell you my story. I've been listening to podcasts for a while now, and I've been hearing everyone's stories, and I figured, hey, why not let everybody know what I've experienced? So I'm going to start at the beginning. I believe people who do have experiences have them for certain reasons, and sometimes they have them a lot. So my first experience happened 
around 1995 or 96. So I was about six years old. And we lived in this house. It was a two-story home. The basement was always really creepy. I remember one time the power went out and my sister and I were on the stairs and we completely froze and just freaked out. My dad and his friend had to come down the stairs and grab us. My sister, she was in a walker around this time. And I remember she completely fell all the way down the steps. And there were probably like, let's say 15 to 20 steps. Tumbled all the way down. She was completely fine. So I believe there were a couple of different forces at play. Like there usually are. I believe there's always energies at play. Good and bad. One night I'm sleeping in my bed. We have a bunk bed. I'm on top. My sister's on bottom. And I wake up out of a dead sleep. And I turn my head to the left. And I can see straight out the door. And there is this black figure standing there. Darker than the dark. There was no night light or anything. But I could see this entity standing there. He was as big as the doorway. I can't remember even seeing any type of facial features. I just kind of remember thinking, like, is this the devil staring at me? Pretty much until this day, I think about it. I just remember I was scared. I covered up my head really fast, and I laid there. And I laid there until I went back to sleep. You know, I passed out from, you know, probably fear. And I woke up the next morning like everything was normal. But that was just one story out of many that I have. But yeah, even recalling that entity kind of, I don't know, sends a type of shock through my body, which is why now to this day, I listen to anything my children tell me. And I vibe off of energies. I know when there's something around. And I choose to not be scared because when I was younger, this thing really traumatized me. And now I'm older and I know I'm stronger than whatever that darkness is. And yeah, I just wanted to share my story because I love hearing all the stories. Can't wait to hear more. I binge listen all the time. Keep up the good work and thank you so much. Bye. Hi, Derek. First time caller here. This is Hallie calling from Arizona. I'm calling to tell everybody about my definite sleep paralysis story. I find it a little bit different than what others have described. And it's also the first time I've ever experienced sleep paralysis. So this happened two nights ago. I was having a hard time sleeping because I think I drank too much coffee during the day earlier. So I was kind of in this weird state of being tired but not able to sleep. Went to bed around 11 and I think in the next two to three hours is when I had the sleep paralysis experience. So sometime around one to two in the morning. It started off by me hearing the sounds of something clomping up the stairs. And at the time I thought maybe in my sleepy state that it was painters on the roof because we're getting our condo painted right now. So at first I didn't register it, but it was so loud and it's such a weird time of the night that it finally registered that it was not normal. And I started getting really freaked out thinking that something or somebody was coming up the stairs. At this point, I opened my eyes and the thing I saw walking through my doorway, so when I'm in my bed, I'm facing the doorway, was at least six feet tall. The, the best way I can think of describing it is very tall and it had horns, like really wide horns, which was super strange. And it looked like it had like animal skins on its head, kind of, like it was wearing a skull, I guess or something like that. I couldn't see the face. It was all just in shadow because we do have a low light hallway light that would be behind this thing. So at that point, I started screaming in my sleep or trying to, kind of that silent scream that's super frustrating because you can't do anything, which at this point I realized I was experiencing sleep paralysis because I couldn't get up. I couldn't move. I was trying to scream for my partner that was sleeping right next to me. 
obviously he didn't hear me. At this point, when I realized that that was what I was experiencing, I closed my eyes and took a couple deep breaths. And it was like all the stress just kind of left. And then I opened my eyes and the thing was gone. And I guess I just went, get, went back to bed after that. So super short experience, but the description of it was very different than what I've heard from anybody else ever explain when they have sleep paralysis experiences. So I thought I should call that in, be interested to see if anybody has seen anything similar to that in any other context at all. Thanks for taking my call and keep up the good work. Hi Derek, my name is Alexis, I'm from Florida. I've sent in a couple calls in the past, but I haven't heard them on the air yet, so I'm patiently waiting. But I have a quick story about sleep paralysis, which might not be very interesting, but I know this is kind of a wide phenomenon, so I'd like to contribute to the conversation. So this happened about three years ago, and I moved out of my parents' house to go to college, and I lived away for about a year, and then I moved back into my parents' house, and so I was sleeping in my old bedroom with my sister, and we had bunk beds, so I would sleep on the top. And I think maybe what would have contributed to this is that I had just moved, so maybe I was under a little bit of stress or something, but I had a sleep paralysis dream where this was in the morning, so everyone else had left for school and work, and it was just me sleeping. And in this dream or whatever it was, I was in my exact same position that I was in real life. I was laying on my right side with my back to the door, and I was, like, staring at the wall. In this dream, I heard someone enter the room, and they turned on the light, and rationally, I was like, oh, my sister has returned for some reason, even though she had just left for school. And so I didn't move. I just said out loud, oh, hey, what are you doing back here? I was like, Courtney, what are you doing here? Which is her name. And I suddenly felt this intense pressure on my side, like someone was leaning over me and I felt a pressure on my ear like someone was trying to talk in my ear and in this low demonic voice that's the only way I can describe it was like demonic this voice said I'm not Courtney and it was so real and so intense and like I could feel everything that I thought it was real I could not move I was stuck in that position I was just staring at the wall like totally terrified and I was trying to get myself out of it like trying to move and I couldn't and finally I like moved my foot or something and then I was able to open my eyes and I was in that same exact position like staring right at the same wall except this was like reality and I slowly like looked around the room was still dark no one was in there and I was obviously freaked out so I like ran into the living room and slept on the couch for a couple hours but that's the most intense dream that I've ever had and it almost made me question like was it a dream was it something different I don't know but yeah, I've never had anything else like that since then, but it really, really scared me, like, quite a bit. Love your podcast so much. I listen all the time. Thanks. Bye. Decades and decades and decades. Make sure you choose... Responders, police officers, military... Now I can picture many of you now, driving down a long, dark, and lonesome highway. Those nightmarish entries reverberating in the back of your mind. All I can say is, welcome to my world. And speaking of my world, I might be taking this week off to chill and grill and do all the things that come with the celebration of our nation's independence. But I have one new entry that I just have to share with you this week, given the holiday and all. So coming to us from the northern part of my state is Lorenzo out of California. Hi Derek, this is Lorenzo in northern California. I'm calling about a UFO I saw on 4th of July a couple days ago. So I was getting off work at about 10 at night it might have been a little bit before that and you know it's fourth of july so i'm scanning the skies looking at the various fireworks people are letting off and i notice a strange light just sort of 
hovering. It was a red light, but it was changing color. It was started red, then it would have changed to white, then green, then red, then white, then green. And I thought, oh, that's odd. So I got in my car and decided to, because it was a good ways out, I decided, you know what, I'm going to drive a little bit closer to it. So I, I did, and as I got closer to it, I discovered it wasn't one light changing color, but rather there were three lights. From left to right, they were green, green, red. And what was happening was that the red light stayed on consistently, and then the middle green light would turn on, then the left green light would turn on, then both of the green lights would shut off, then the middle light would turn on, left light on, off, middle, left, off, middle, left, off, and so on. And I couldn't tell if it was moving or not because I was in my car and it was fairly busy, so I couldn't like find a parking space to get back out and observe from the ground. It, it seems to be fairly low to the ground, but I couldn't gauge size or distance. Uh, and yeah, that was it. So if anyone else was in Northern California and saw something odd in the skies on 4th of July that wasn't illegal fireworks, yeah, I'd like to know if they corroborate anything. So that's it for this story. Thanks. Love your podcast. Recently discovered it. Currently in the process of binging it. Thank you, Lorenzo, for calling in. Now, most of you know this, but I grew up back in Ohio, rural Ohio. And on the 4th, we would head to the area's largest town, over to the city park, to watch the fireworks display that they had set up for us, which in reality was not very big. But I suppose it was a good show, and it certainly blew my mind as a child. All that action, the booming sounds, the bright lights, all those explosions. Truly a once in a year event. Then in my 20s, I moved to Southern California. And that's when I learned that the firework display from my hometown pales in comparison to what even the dude across the street had going on here in LA. And these amateur displays weren't limited to just one day. They let these things off the entire week, not just the fourth itself. In all honesty, it's the sort of thing that would give you Vietnam flashbacks, even if you were never over there. And it wasn't just this guy. Every street and every neighborhood were launching these huge, illegal rockets. The exact same fireworks that the pros use at displays like the one I attended growing up. I can only assume they get these black market from Mexico or something because you certainly can't buy them here. But anyway, the point here is, fireworks are somehow very popular out here in California. And so are drones. And I'm seeing tons of those everywhere I go these days. I see one over my house at least once a week, which I will admit freaked me out at first, until I finally realized there were real estate agents photographing nearby homes that were for sale. But for a few months there, I was certain I was being surveilled. And you know, the last few times that we caught a fireworks display, which was down here at our lake, front row seats thanks to our friend, Celine. Well, the past couple of years, I noticed more and more drones hovering off to the side of the main firework display. I can only assume they're there filming all the action and capturing quite an angle, I would imagine. So the purpose of my ramble here is that if it's happening in this part of California, I can only assume that it could happen in NorCal as well. Is it possible that this was some sort of drone filming a nearby fireworks display? And could it have been one of these specialized drones for commercial filming, which tend to be much larger and more complicated than your everyday consumer model? And that part of the country is absolutely stunning. It would be the ideal location to try to catch the perfect shot. Fireworks in the foreground and the green rolling mountains in the background. But let's just imagine for a quick moment that it wasn't a drone that Lorenzo saw that night. Now, believe it or not, if you're like Lorenzo and you too saw a UFO in the fourth, 
you're actually in good company. Because this is what an article from The Economist has to say on that subject. According to the National UFO Reporting Center, an American nonprofit organization that has collected reports of unidentified flying objects since 1974, UFO sightings tend to spike on July 4th. Between 1995 and 2018, around 2% of all sightings recorded by the National UFO Reporting Center fell on this date, seven times more than would be expected by chance. So is it that all these fireworks are being mistaken for unidentified craft? Or is it that drones are up there filming them, and that's what people are seeing? Or is there some sort of attraction here? Do all these bright lights bring something in? like a moth to a flame? Or is it simply that during the 4th of July, everyone's eyes are already trained upwards, much more than they would be any other time of the year? And that's the reason the sightings seem to jump that day. Well, regardless of the cause, we thank you, Lorenzo, for calling in. And I trust you'll all be keeping your eyes to the skies this 4th of July. Now, folks, that's going to do it for this episode. Monsters Among Us is written and produced by me, Derek Hayes. Copyright Red Crow Media. Additional support is provided by Sarah Carter Hayes and Delaney Bowers. All media used in this production is done so under the protection of fair use. Please follow us on social media. Give us a like and follow at YouTube. And leave us a rate and review wherever that sort of thing may be possible. Don't forget to visit the Unex Network every Saturday at 11 p.m. Eastern to catch Monsters Among Us on digital radio. And finally, tonight's score was provided by Iron Cthulhu Apocalypse, Co.ag Music, and Carl Casey at White Bat Audio. Now, there's no secret story this week, but I will be back next week with a brand new special episode. Till then, keep it spooky. Be careful with those firecrackers. Keep those fingers and eyeballs where they're supposed to be. And above all else, have yourself a good night.